If he'd been born in the 17th century, Donald Merritt would probably have been a buccaneer. He may have become wealthy in the King's service, knighted even. But by the 20th century, such flamboyant and wicked characters were no longer admired nor tolerated by society. His timing in this respect was all wrong. And he was, by common consent, a very bad man. But he succeeded, for a time at least, in getting away with murder. Rita Sutherland had just cleared away the breakfast dishes at 31 Buckingham Terrace, where she worked as a day maid in Edinburgh. As she put some coal in the kitchen grate, she heard a loud bang, followed by a scream and then a heavy thud. Moments later, 17-year-old Donald Merritt rushed into the kitchen. Rita, my mother has shot herself, he said. It was approximately half past nine on the morning of the 17th of March, 1926. He told Rita they had argued over money and that she had taken a pistol and shot herself. Together they returned from the kitchen to the sitting room where Donald had been reading just a few minutes before and his mother had been writing letters at the bureau. Mrs. Merritt lay on the floor with a bullet wound in her right ear and a pistol was on the bureau. She was still alive, but unconscious. Two police constables arrived with an ambulance, took the Spanish-made automatic pistol away, and heard Donald and Rita's account of the incident. Donald told them that his mother had money worries, and had shot herself. Mrs. Merritt was taken to Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, and placed in the custody ward, because attempted suicide in 1926 was a crime, for which she would be arrested and charged on her recovery. A Detective Inspector David Fleming arrived to investigate the circumstances of the shooting with a view to charging Mrs. Merritt with attempted suicide. On the bureau, he found two letters from the Clydesdale Bank informing her that her account was overdrawn. There was also a half-written letter she appeared to have been in the middle of writing at the time of the incident. It was, he said later, a chatty letter in tone, and it gave no hint of any desperate thoughts Mrs. Merritt was entertaining. Inspector Fleming left the half-finished note on the bureau where he found it, and decided the shooting was a suicide attempt. At lunchtime that day, Mrs. Merritt regained consciousness at the hospital and seemed confused. She said, Donald was standing beside me while I wrote a letter. I said to him, Go away. The next thing I heard was a kind of explosion. I do not remember anything more. Mrs. Merritt was paralyzed down one side and had a bullet lodged in the base of her skull, and although in pain, she appeared to be quite lucid. She made a number of comments to nurses, a doctor, and to relatives in the following days, which confirmed her story that she was at her desk when she heard a loud explosion. Although the police were informed of these statements, they made no attempt to interview her, and continued to treat the matter as an attempted suicide and to await her recovery. Perhaps it was to take his mind off this terrible business that Donald went out to his favourite dance hall and hired his favourite instructress, Betty Christie, for the evening. He took her to Queen's Ferry on his new motorcycle. Then, almost two weeks after the shooting, an uncle who was staying at the house with his wife to take care of Donald, and not entirely satisfied with what he saw of his nephew's conduct, discovered a spent... .25 cartridge near the window, a distance of some eight feet from the bureau at which Mrs. Merritt had been sitting. He informed the police of this, and Inspector Fleming decided to interview Donald. Donald told him he had purchased the pistol in February for a forthcoming holiday in France, and planned to shoot with it that Saturday, which was why it was loaded, 
but that his mother had confiscated it. But he was not quite clear on this point, and there seemed to be some doubt as to whether or not his mother actually knew of the pistol at all. On the 27th of March, Mrs. Merritt, who had been lucid for most of the time since her accident, began to deteriorate. She became incoherent, delirious, and then slipped into a coma, and on the 1st of April, 1926, she died. John Donald Merritt was born on the 17th of August, 1908, at Levine, New Zealand. His father, John Alfred Merritt, a 29-year-old mechanical engineer, had met Bertha Milner, the daughter of a wealthy Manchester wine merchant, in Egypt, and the two married and settled in New Zealand. John had a wanderlust, and his chosen career took him to South Africa, India, the USA, and around 1911 to St. Petersburg in Russia. His wife and young son, Donald, travelled with him and lived for a time in St. Petersburg. But relations between the husband and wife appeared to have declined, or at least John had tired of Bertha, and as she found the cold Russian winters ill-suited to her young son, whom she doted on and fussed over excessively, she travelled to Switzerland with him, leaving her husband at his work in St. Petersburg. John seems to have taken this opportunity to sever ties with his wife and son, and he never saw either of them again. Mrs. Merritt subsequently told people that she was a widow, her husband having died during the Russian Revolution, which was untrue. Bertha had a private income of £700 a year, so was quite comfortably off. She hired a governess for Donald, and they spent the war in Switzerland, and thereafter moved to New Zealand, where Donald went to school. He was a bright but dilatory boy, with a dislike of school and authority, but a love for adventure stories, and a passion for sailing. In 1924, when Donald was 16, Mrs. Merritt decided her son, who had a gift for languages, should join the diplomatic service, and in preparation for this, she sent him to Malvern Public School, which she hoped would be followed by Oxford. But Donald spent only a year at the school before he was expelled, possibly over an incident involving a local girl. It was a disappointment for Mrs. Merritt, and she realised that Donald would need to be kept on a tight leash if he was to make a career for himself. So she abandoned thoughts of Oxford and decided instead that he should attend Edinburgh University, that she would move there with him, and Donald could live at home while he studied under her watchful eye. Donald accordingly registered at Edinburgh University for an arts degree in January 1926. But his academic career was short-lived. He had no interest in studies, but he was interested in girls. He quickly stopped attending university, unbeknownst to his mother, and instead visited Dunedin Palais de Dance, where he would hire a dance instructress for ten shillings for an afternoon. Unfortunately, he only received ten shilling per week allowance from his mother, so this was quite inadequate for his amorous purposes. If he wished to hire his favourite instructress, Betty Christie, for a night, then it would cost him thirty shillings, far beyond his means. But Donald Merritt was nothing if not resourceful. He discovered he could forge his mother's signature, and he began, in February just a month after their arrival in Edinburgh, to cash in cheques in her name at her Clydesdale bank. In a little more than a month, he had cashed in cheques for more than £450, approximately £28,000 in 2020 terms, and spent this money on a motorcycle, jewellery for Betty, and, of course, on hiring Betty out for evenings. It seems that for all this time, his mother believed him to be attending university. But of course it was a fool's paradise he inhabited. In the two days before the shooting at 31 Buckingham Terrace, the inevitable happened. Mrs. Merritt received a letter from the bank, informing her that her account was overdrawn, which greatly puzzled her. 
she received a second letter from the bank on the fateful morning of the 17th of March, 1926. With the death of Mrs. Merritt on the 1st of April, the matter seemed to be closed. She was, as a suicide, buried in unhallowed ground, to the chagrin of her sister Annie, and Donald inherited his mother's fortune. But in this he was to be disappointed. Under the terms of her will, her money was to be placed in trust for Donald until his twenty-first birthday. Until then he would receive just two pounds a week. This must have represented to Donald a significant disappointment. He was improvident and impatient by nature. He continued to withdraw money from his mother's bank account, and the Clydesdale Bank contacted police. Following a police inquiry, it was ascertained that Donald had forged 29 cheques in his mother's name. It also became apparent that this was the source of Mrs. Merritt's money worries, which Donald had alluded to, rather than to any financial mismanagement on her part. This also accounted for the two letters which were on her desk at the time of the shooting on the 17th of March. Together with the finding of the .25 spent cartridge some eight feet from the bureau, the police, belatedly, became suspicious. They experimented, firing a pistol from various distances, and arrived at the conclusion that Mrs. Merritt could not possibly have fired the shot herself, and that she had been shot from a little distance away. On the 1st of December 1926, eight months after his mother's death, Donald Merritt was arrested and charged with uttering 29 forged checks, and also with the murder of his mother, Bertha Merritt. The trial of John Donald Merritt began on the 1st of February 1927 at the High Court of Judiciary in Edinburgh's Parliament Square before Lord Justice Clerk Lord Alness. Lord Advocate William Watson was the Chief Prosecutor. The Crown case was that Merritt had issued false cheques to the value of £457, 13 shillings and sixpence, more than £28,000 in today's terms, that he had exhausted the available funds in his mother's Clydesdale bank account, that his mother had discovered this upon receiving two letters from the bank, and that he had shot her because, even if she had not realised why her bank account was overdrawn, this would inevitably be discovered very soon. There were two separate charges. The first was of fraud, of uttering false checks. The second was of murder. The first charge was evidenced by the forged signatures, which Merritt had accomplished by tracing over a copy of his mother's signature using a violet-blue carbon tissue, and then by tracing over this a second time with a pen to make a fresh impression. It was also apparent, from the account of the extensive purchases Donald had made in the month before the shooting incident, that this had been the source of his money. The second charge, that of murder, depended upon the first charge to a degree, in that it provided Donald Merritt with a clear and discernible motive for murdering his mother, a motive whose urgency had increased since the letters from the Clydesdale Bank had arrived. The prosecution case cited Donald's purchase of the pistol eleven days after forging the first cheque, the dire circumstances he was in having drained his mother's bank account, and on the statements Mrs. Merritt had made during her lucid period in hospital to various people. The prosecution further cited the chatty letter described by Inspector Fleming on his visit to the house, whose tone did not suggest the state of mind of a woman contemplating suicide. Indeed, he recollected that the letter had not been finished, which suggested that she was in the process of writing it when she was shot. The lack of powder burns around the bullet hole made it inconceivable, in the view of the noted forensic surgeon, Professor Littlejohn, who carried out the post-mortem, for Mrs. Merritt to have fired the pistol herself. 
The peculiar, strained angle at which the bullet had entered the head made this even more unlikely. In addition, the general confusion that Mrs. Merritt had exhibited when asked in hospital what had happened, and the statement she made concerning her telling Donald to go away and then hearing a loud explosion, seemed consistent with the notion that she had been shot by the only other person in the room at the time, the person who owned the gun, a gun only recently purchased, and the only person who stood to gain by her death, her son, Donald Merritt. The evidence presented and the circumstances given should have been enough for a conviction, but the defence case which was in the hands of the excellent barrister Craigie Aitchison was by no means a hopeless one. First, the police had made a terrible mess of the initial investigation. The pistol had been taken away without fingerprint testing, nor had the letter Mrs. Merritt had been writing and which Inspector Fleming had seen on the Bureau been collected by police. It had been left on the Bureau and subsequently destroyed by Donald. Second, although various comments made by Mrs. Merritt clearly suggested that she knew nothing of the matter, except that she had told her son to go away before hearing a loud explosion, differing accounts of this were given. For instance, referring to the same incident, Annie Penn, her 60-year-old sister, said that Mrs. Merritt had told her that an explosion went off in my head, as if Donald had shot me. But a ward sister testified that she had heard Mrs. Merritt say, Did Donald do it? He is such a naughty boy. Though both statements imply Donald's involvement, the latter suggested that Annie Penn had planted the idea in her mind. Aitchison was able to cast doubt on Mrs. Penn's veracity by pointing out that her own son would stand to inherit his grandfather's fortune if Donald was hanged for the crime. Unfortunately, the police had not taken a statement from Mrs. Merritt at any point while she was in hospital, although the doctor looking after her, Dr. Holcomb, told the court she had been lucid for a full week. The defence barrister, Aitchison, took full advantage of this deficiency, saying it represented a serious neglect of duty on the police part not to have taken a dying deposition from Mrs. Merritt in that crucial week. If they had, he said, his client would not be standing in court on trial for murder at the present moment. Third, Professor Littlejohn, who carried out the post-mortem, and who testified that it would have been impossible for Mrs. Merritt to have shot herself, given that there were no scorch marks near the wound, had made no reference to this in his post-mortem report. He had accepted the police view that the incident was suicide, and had proceeded on this basis. It seriously undermined his testimony that he had done so. Fourth, Although the possibility of Mrs. Merritt shooting herself at close range without leaving scorch marks on her wound was said to be inconceivable, the defence called two witnesses whose testimony carried enormous weight, the London gunsmith Robert Churchill and the Home Office pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury. The two had conducted tests on behalf of the defence to prove that it was possible to shoot from close range without leaving scorch marks. Churchill claimed that women instinctively recoil from a gun when firing it, and this action would have created the necessary distance from the gun nozzle to avoid burn marks to the wound area. Spilsbury also said that women have greater flexibility and thus the peculiar angle of the bullet entry wound offered no impediment to Mrs. Merritt's shooting herself. The defence barrister, Aitchison, referred to Merritt as a lad, and he chose not to put him in the witness box. He asked the jury to acquit his client, because of the reasonable doubt there was in the matter, to give him a clean slate. So far as I can judge, he told them, he will never dishonour your verdict. 
The judge, in his summing up, called the evidence obtained in the matter by police unsatisfactory, one might even say deplorable. He referred to the failure of police to take a dying deposition in spite of ample opportunity of doing so, leaving the prosecution with a series of alleged statements from Mrs. Merritt made to a variety of persons under various conditions, which were casual, conflicting and ambiguous. He concurred with the defence that the accused was deserving of every benefit that reasonable doubt could confer. The fifteen jury men and women retired to consider their verdict. In Scotland there are three possible verdicts. Guilty, not guilty and not proven. When the jury returned after an absence of fifty-five minutes, they gave their verdict in the capital charge as not proven. Thus the verdict was effectively a statement that the jury believed merit to be guilty, but that the prosecution had failed to prove it. It deprived Donald Merritt of the absolution of an innocent verdict. Apparently five of the jurors voted him guilty, and ten voted for a verdict of not proven. None thought him innocent. On the lesser charge of forging cheques, the jury found him guilty, and he was sentenced to twelve months in prison for this. In such cases where a defendant has stood their trial in peril of their life, and by good fortune, or with or by the officers of a great barrister, have emerged from the shadow of the scaffold, it is usual that there is little heard of them again. The weight they have borne, and the huge scrutiny to which they have been exposed by the processes of the law, by the media and the public, has usually and understandably diminished, if not crushed, their spirit. Often they change their name, and live a subdued life of obscurity, shunning the limelight for the rest of their lives. It would have been well, perhaps for all, including for Donald Merritt, if this had been the case. But it wasn't. The noted criminologist William Ruffhead concluded his account of the trial and its outcome in 1929 by saying he had not heard what had become of Merritt. But you never can tell. We may do so yet. He wrote. This turned out to be prophetic because although Merritt had undoubtedly got away with murder, his story had only just begun. Donald Merritt served his sentence for fraud at Sorton Prison in Edinburgh, and on his discharge in early 1928, he went to live with a friend of his mother's, Mrs. Mary Bonner, and her 17-year-old daughter, Vera, at Bexhill in Sussex. He was still only 19 years old, but the patterns by which he would live his life henceforth had been firmly established. After only a month with Mary Bonner, in March 1928, he eloped with her daughter Vera to Glasgow, and they were married. Thereafter they lived in a tent near Newcastle-on-Tyne, and Merritt supported them by issuing fraudulent checks in the name of McCormick. Predictably enough, it didn't last long, Within three months they were arrested and charged with obtaining goods to the value of two hundred pounds under false pretenses. Vera was discharged, but Merritt received a nine-month prison sentence. He gave his name as Ronald Chesney, and it was in this name he served his sentence. His second prison term, although he was not yet twenty. Donald Merritt, now known as Ronald Chesney, emerged from prison in early 1929, and a few months afterwards, at the age of just 21 years, he inherited £50,000 from his maternal grandfather. This was a considerable windfall. He was still receiving £2 a week from his mother's estate at the time, whose additional capital reverted to him also. His total worth was around £60,000, 
a sum of about £4 million in 2020 terms. Ronald Chesney was a very wealthy man, and he began to live like one. His one act of caution at this time was to settle £8,400 on Vera, by which he sought to insure against any future dire reversal of fortune. This was to have great consequences for them both. Vera's mother, Mary Bonner, married again in 1930 to a rather odd man called Thomas Chalmers Menzies, who was Scottish, wore a kilt, and styled himself Baron Menzies. The marriage was of short duration, perhaps because Sir Thomas Menzies was in fact a commercial traveller with no right whatever to the title. In any case, after their divorce, Mary Menzies continued to call herself Lady Menzies for the rest of her life. Ronald, with his wife Vera and Lady Menzies, began to enjoy his newfound wealth. He bought a mansion near Weybridge in Surrey, an open tour of Bentley, in which he was a well-known sight driving up to London. He owned racecourses, and he gave lavish parties, which delighted Lady Menzies and his wife Vera. Money ran through his fingers at an astonishing rate. He had not lost his love of sailing and adventure either. They toured the Mediterranean in his luxury yacht, the Armenteras. He saw himself as a buccaneer and played the part to the hilt. He obtained a pilot's license and a gypsy moth two-seater aeroplane and began smuggling contraband between the continent and England. He grew a beard and pierced his ears, wearing one and sometimes two large gold earrings. His appearance and full beard, as well as his larger-than-life persona, gave him the look of a latter-day blackbeard. Throughout the 1930s, Chesney spent increasing amounts of time on the continent, and in the Mediterranean, along with his wife Vera and Lady Menzies, he was rumoured to have been involved in smuggling diamonds to Amsterdam, of running guns during the Spanish Civil War, and drugs from North Africa. How successful he was at this is debatable, but the lifestyle certainly appealed to him. Ronald Chesney was, as he always had been, an insatiable womanizer, and in time Vera, who had found her husband's amoral adventuring a great thrill in the hedonistic days of the late twenties and early thirties, began to tire of it. She had several miscarriages, which may have blunted her enthusiasm for adventure, and in spite of adopting a girl, Anne, it does not appear to have improved matters. Vera drank a great deal, chiefly gin, and husband and wife separated. In between his affairs, especially as his fortunes ebbed, they reconciled for periods too. When war came in 1939, it was something of a relief to Chesney and his flagging fortunes. He quickly became a temporary lieutenant in the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve and commander of a fast boat in the Mediterranean. Here he ran his smuggling operations in parallel with his naval duties. He was captured by the Italians at the fall of Tobruk in 1942, but released as part of an exchange of prisoners in 1943 although he frequently claimed he had escaped. After the war ended, although still in uniform, his black marketeering continued unabated. England and Europe was rich with opportunities for amoral entrepreneurs, and Chesney took full advantage of these. In 1946 it led to his arrest, court-martial, and to his dishonorable discharge, and to four months in prison in Hamburg. It was around this time that Chesney took up with a 20-year-old woman called Gerda Schaller, who hailed from the Russian sector in Germany, and whom he helped to obtain false papers. She became his lover and accomplice in his escapades. He was no more faithful to her than he had been to Vera or to any other woman, but she appeared to be very loyal to him and joined in his activities with relish. He wrote to Vera, asking her for a divorce so that he could marry Gerda. 
Gerda also wrote to Vera, imploring her to free Chesney so that she could marry him, but Vera was not prepared to release him. It may have been because she was a Roman Catholic that she would not entertain the idea of divorce, but it seems more likely to have been that she was not prepared to give him up. She often wrote to him in affectionate terms, and, when it suited him, he wrote to her also. By the late 1940s, money had run out for Chesney. Even a large fortune such as he possessed could not sustain his incessant profligate spending forever. The mansion was gone, so was the Rolls-Royce. He had lost boats and cars as a result of impounding by customs authorities, and also through his own lack of financial acumen. He always knew how to spend money better than to make it, and the differential between these two talents was considerable. He tried to persuade Vera to release the £8,000, which was now more than £10,000, that had been put in trust for a rainy day. But Vera refused. She and her mother were running a care home for elderly people called Sunset House in West Ealing, and Vera seemed to have no interest in divorce. Chesney spent increasing amounts of time in jail in the next few years. He was jailed in Hamburg in 1946 for larceny, in Paris in 1947 for smuggling, again in Paris in 1948 for currency trafficking, and in Bern, Switzerland for dealing in forged currency, and was fined 30,000 francs in France for offences against aliens regulations in 1949. The same year, he was jailed and deported from Belgium for illegal entry. It was from here that he wrote to Vera again, trying to persuade her to divorce him, but to no avail. Gerda Schaller, meanwhile, served sentences for her part in his illegal activities, but she seemed to possess a stoical resilience to her misfortunes. In 1952, Chesney, now quite broke and serving a sentence of Wandsworth Prison, apparently offered a cellmate, Herbert Boyd, £1,000 to kill his wife by running her over in a car. It is not clear how serious he was in this suggestion, but it shows he was entertaining the idea of killing Vera by this time at least. On his release from Wandsworth, he returned to the continent. By now he was based in Cologne, still trying to smuggle cigarettes and other goods under cover of being an importer-exporter. It was here he met a 26-year-old greengrocer's daughter called Sonia Sophia Vinikas at a Cologne nightclub. She was very attractive and lived in the nearby town of Duran. Ronald Chesney had a new obsession. Gerda Schaller was at once forgotten. It gave him a new lease of life and also a new sense of urgency. He asked his wife again for a divorce, this time so he could marry Sonia Vinikas. But she had no intention, it seems, of giving him up to some German woman. Then, in 1952, he changed tack. He wrote in very friendly terms to Vera, trying to persuade her to visit him in Cologne, to try her luck at the casino there, and made no mention of divorce or money. But she rebuffed him, according to their adopted daughter Anne Troll, because Vera was afraid of an accident occurring while she was there. She knew her husband, she knew what he was capable of, and she must certainly have known that he had killed his mother in 1926, because Chesney never exercised any discretion in such matters. He had apparently told Gerda Schaller that he had killed his mother, although he claimed he had done so by accident. He frequently referred to the time I murdered my mother in conversations with friends. It was impossible for them to know whether or not to take these assertions seriously. Chesney's fortunes had changed. In the early 1950s, the world had changed. Chesney was in his forties and had little or no money. The black market, which had flourished during the war as a natural consequence of rationing, had come to an end. 
The license which war had given to shady entrepreneurs like Chesney had ended too. Countries were cooperating again, and police forces, purred to the bone by wartime manpower requirements, had returned to full complement. Interpol had reformed after the war and become a focus for international cooperation in criminal matters. Customs authorities were not so easily deceived by solitary airplanes landing on deserted airstrips or by cars loaded with contraband concealed in false compartments slipping across ill-defined borders. Chesney was finding life difficult. He could obtain neither the £10,000 from Vera nor a divorce from her to release a share of it to him. Of course, if Vera died the £10,000 would revert to him. It was now that Chesney decided on the second great gamble of his life. He decided to murder Vera. He gave the matter some thought. Then, in early 1953, he met a man who looked vaguely similar to himself. He was heavily built, about his own age but shorter, clearly shaven and wore glasses. He discovered the man's name to be Leslie Chown, a photographer operating from a houseboat premises in London. He found out his date of birth, and he applied to Somerset House for his birth certificate. Using this, he applied for and obtained a passport in the name of Leslie Chown in June 1953, using a photograph of himself clean-shaven and wearing horn-rimmed glasses. At the end of January 1954, Chesney had a clear plan in place, and he decided on a dry run to check everything worked smoothly. In early February, he flew to London as Chesney. He visited a surprised Vera in Montpellier Road. He was full of charm. He took her to the cinema that evening and travelled back to the continent via Harwich on the 4th of February conspicuously bumping into a policewoman and remarking jovially, I must not knock your policewomen about. It seemed to Chesney that his plan was foolproof. On the 6th of February 1954, Chesney booked into the Frivo Hotel in Amsterdam with Sonia Vinikers as Mr. and Mrs. J.D. Milner. They spent the weekend, Monday and Tuesday, together and she returned to Cologne on the morning of Wednesday, the 10th of February. Several hours later, Chesney travelled to the airport in Amsterdam. It was, of course, Mr. Leslie Chown, who flew to England at 6.30pm with Royal Dutch Airlines, who passed through passport control and who took a coach to Sloan Street in London. He was seen in the vicinity of Sunset House in Montpellier Road at between 10.15 and 10.30 in the evening by two people. He surprised Vera again, this time greeting her with two bottles of gin, Vera's favourite, in his hands. What happened next exactly is not known, but it can easily be guessed. Chesney seemed to have got Vera drunk, very drunk, which was never difficult these days, as he knew. And then he filled the bath with water. He carried her with his shirt sleeves rolled up into the bathroom. Here he lowered Vera into the bath and held her under the water until she drowned. Vera's elbows were bruised, so she may have struggled and been forcibly pinioned to restrain her. Then he wiped his fingerprints from everything he had touched, the bottles, the glasses, and anything else which might incriminate him. But at some point he had an extraordinary piece of ill fortune. He encountered Mary Menzies, Vera's mother. Perhaps she heard something, or perhaps it was just bad luck. It has been suggested that she may have encountered him as he prepared to leave the house but this is unlikely because we know he still had his sleeves rolled up at this point. It must have been a considerable shock to Chesney to come face to face with his mother-in-law, having just murdered her daughter. 
A struggle developed between them, an unequal struggle. Chesney was over six feet tall and weighed up to twenty-two stone. Mary Menzies was seventy-two. But she fought like a wild cat. She clawed his forearms, still bare from his efforts at drowning Vera, tearing flesh from them, which was retained under her fingernails. Of course she was no match for Chesney, and he overcame her. He smashed a coffee pot repeatedly into her head, and then strangled her. This was a terrible unforeseen happening. His intention had been to slip into the country anonymously, quite invisible, drown his wife in the bathtub, and then slip out again that same evening. As he was travelling as Leslie Chown, there would be no record of Ronald Chesney having been in the country. Vera's body would be found in the morning, and it would be established at autopsy that she had had a large amount of alcohol in her blood. The natural conclusion would be that she had fallen into her bath and drowned while heavily inebriated. But now there was a brutal murder of an elderly woman to account for. There could be no possible suggestion that Vera had died as a result of accidental drowning. She had been murdered. Things had gone badly wrong. But Chesney had no choice but to press on with his plan and to try to delay the discovery of the bodies to give himself sufficient time to escape. He wiped everything up and restored as much order to the scene as he could replacing the now-dented coffee-pot on the mantelpiece. He hid the body of Lady Menzies behind a curtain, and he locked the bathroom door from the outside. This would, of course, have removed any chance that it could be concluded that Vera had accidentally drowned, because a third person had obviously locked the door from without. But by now it was clear to Chesney that his plan had failed. Now his mind was working furiously on trying to give himself time to escape before the bodies were discovered, and to ensure that he left no traces of evidence that he had been in the house. There was still, he could reason, no proof that he had ever been in the house or in the country. Chesney left the house somewhat shaken possibly via a defective French window and a broken fence to the rear of the property sometime after 12.30 a.m. He returned to London Airport and flew out as Leslie Chown, arriving back at Amsterdam later that morning. It was the 11th of February, 1954. A care home worker, Eileen Georgina Thorpe, arrived at 8.30 a.m and was surprised to find that neither Mary Menzies nor her daughter were about, and went in search of them. She couldn't find them, and other inquiries failing to locate them, the police were eventually called. They arrived at around 2 p.m. There was no immediate sign of either woman. The bathroom door was locked, and upon entering it, they found Vera Merritt, dead in a bath whose water had drained away. A search of the house revealed Mary Menzies behind a curtain, propped against the wall. A double murder was immediately reported to Scotland Yard's murder squad. By 2.30pm, Superintendent Edmund Wilfred Dawes of CID and Detective Superintendents Barrett and Salter were at the scene. At the same time, the detectives were undertaking a painstaking search and the bodies were being examined at 22 Montpellier Road. A thoughtful Ronald Chesney was sitting down to a meal at the Frivo Hotel in Amsterdam. He was later described as looking worried. He spoke to Sonia Vinikas on the telephone, and then went to bed, asking for an early morning call at 5.30 a.m. He was described as being agitated during breakfast the following morning too after which he ordered a taxi and left the hotel. Policing in London in 1954 was very different than it had been in Edinburgh in 1926. Forensics had become much more advanced. 
procedures in police forces, more exacting and rigorous as regards the collection of evidence and its preservation. Of course, in 1926 it was open to doubt whether Mrs. Merritt had died by her own hand or not. In this case there was no such doubt. There could be no question whatever of this being anything other than a double murder, and such clarity is helpful in focusing resources and a sense of urgency in a police investigation. It also meant that instead of focusing purely on the what, how and wherefore, the police were focused upon ascertaining who. It didn't take them long to guess. Within hours the women's backgrounds and relations had been established. Three thousand letters had been found, and from a perusal of these, the chief suspect was quickly identified as being Ronald Chesney, Vera's estranged husband, a man known to police not only in the UK but throughout Europe as a persistent offender, a convict many times over, a man known for slipping across borders, a man who stood to gain £10,000 from his wife's death, and a man who, as Donald Merritt, was known to have got away with the murder of his mother nearly three decades earlier. On the 13th of February, the Police Gazette issued a notice to Interpol and to all ports, airports and police stations in the UK, alerting them to keep a lookout for the big, burly man known as Ronald Chesney, also known as Donald Merritt and John Milner, who was wanted for questioning in the brutal murder of two women in a West London care home. The case escalated rapidly. The press were busy and by the 13th of February, the Dundee Courier was reporting, pointedly, that the Strangler had sufficient time to reach even the continent. Also, that the women had known their attacker because their dogs did not raise the alarm. Accounts of the murders were published prominently in English newspapers, and by Sunday, the 14th of February, they were openly naming Chesney as the chief suspect. Ronald Chesney was a hunted man. He knew it too. He sat in a cafe in Cologne, in the shadow of the great cathedral, furtively reading English newspapers he had bought. Worse, Scotland Yard knew that Chesney was living in West Germany, knew that he was associated with Sonja Vinikers, and they contacted the German police to assist. Chesney spent the weekend with Sonia. She saw him off at Duran Station on Monday the 15th of February and believed he was travelling to England, having read of the Ealing murders in Cologne and of the suspicions gathering about him. He seems to have spent some time that day in Cologne considering his next move. He was at a loss. He had no money and no friends. As a sailor, Chesney liked to sail close to the wind. He took huge risks. Sometimes they paid off, but mostly they didn't. He couldn't calculate the odds. The only time he won at gambling was when he used the loaded dice, which he frequently carried with him in his pocket. Now in his pocket he had a Colt forty-five revolver. Chesney overestimated himself and underestimated everyone else, especially the police and the authorities. He was not immoral, he was amoral. He had not the moral core within which dictates ethical behavior in most human beings, possibly because he was arrogant enough to believe such moral strictures did not apply to him. He was short-sighted, catastrophically so. He had no capacity whatever to look beyond the immediate future. His imagination was single-tracked. It conceived of everything he undertook in one simple plane that led to success. His entire approach in life was governed by a childish sense of immediate gratification. When he forged his mother's checks to an amount equivalent today to £28,000, it was inevitable that he would be caught. 
but he disregarded this for the immediate gratification of obtaining money so that he could take Betty Christie out. The fact that he had not attended university for more than a couple of weeks before abandoning it would inevitably be discovered. But his only thought was for the immediate benefit of securing the company of Betty Christie for a few hours. It led to him murdering his mother. This in itself was a huge risk, and he had no ability to calculate the odds that he would get away with it. That he did was more to do with the sheer incompetence of the police in their initial inquiries than to any intelligence on his part. And he took Betty Christie dancing on the very day he had shot his mother, without any regard for the suspicions such an action might occasion. He wanted immediate gratification. The consequences which might arise from this he would deal with tomorrow. It was so when he eloped with Vera in 1928 and lived for three months by forging cheques until he was caught. He had a great capacity for living in the moment, for living for today, but none whatsoever for balancing this against the needs of tomorrow. He spent his inherited fortune in a few years until he was broke. Then he tried to supplement its loss by smuggling. He was a gambler doubling down with ever-increasing risks. He spent most of his time in prison after the war, in Belgium, Germany, France and in Britain, repeatedly. Nor did he possess any capacity to learn from his past or his errors. He repeated the same mistakes over and over in ever-decreasing circles. In 1926, his great gamble in killing his doting and possessive mother for her fortune had, by the skin of its teeth, paid off. In 1954, his gamble had not. His long history of misdemeanors was catching him up. On the afternoon of the 15th of February, 1954, Ronald Chesney appeared to have made up his mind. He spoke to his solicitor, Stephen Clark, by telephone and told him he had seen the newspapers, but that he had nothing to do with the murders, that he had not even been in the country at the time. Clark advised Chesney to return to England. Chesney said he would do so within a week and told Clark to get possession of Vera's £10,000 settlement as soon as possible. Clark said he would need a letter of authorization to apply for the settlement, and Chesney said he would send him one. He wrote a letter to Clark immediately confirming that he authorized him to seek settlement of the £10,000. He then strode over to a taxi rank outside the station and asked the driver to take him to the Hook of Holland. When the taxi driver, Hans Hemmed, demurred, he paid him up front. They started off on the long journey, but after a time Chesney had a change of mind. He ordered Hem to take him to Duran instead. Even now his mind was trying to find a way through. It had not accepted the inevitable. The taxi driver took him to Sonja's house at 51 Josefstrasse, and a man answered the door and told him she was not at home, which he plainly disbelieved. It seems the newspaper reports concerning Chesney were affecting her. He sat in the cab fulminating and wrote her a letter, asking the cab driver to deliver it at the house. But the man who answered the door refused to take it. The driver then took him to a cafe. He sat there with a cab driver and brooded listlessly. He seemed to want company, but he was thoughtful, far away drummed his fingers on the table and sat in silence, staring out of the window. It was now dark. They drank coffee and brandy, and then, just before midnight, he told the taxi driver to take him to Sonia's home again. He tapped on her window. No response. There seemed nowhere to turn. He posted the letter through Sonia's letterbox and returned to the taxi. At length he told the taxi driver to take him to the central station in Cologne. Here he paid him off and sat on a bench where he wrote another letter to his solicitor and then a note. 
he had finally come to a decision. It was after midnight, cold, and his breath on the night air illuminated him. His hands were in his pockets as he left Cologne Station. He was wearing a grey overcoat and a blue suit and a trilby hat. The faces and voices chattering in the night came and went. They didn't seem to notice the big man as he left the station and turned away westwards from the city. He walked along Arkenastrasse westwards. He walked for three miles and arrived at a suburban wooded area in the small outlying area of Lindenthal. The autumn leaves were still on the floor, still curled and crisp underfoot. There was no one about, just the vague noise of distant traffic passing in the night. Ronald Chesney reached a clearing a little way into the woods and took his hand from his coat pocket. In it was his Colt forty-five revolver. It was warm because his hand had been on it for some time, returned to it repeatedly for comfort, like his lucky loaded dice. He put the nozzle inside his mouth and pulled the trigger. The single shot rang out and the heavy figure of Ronald Chesney crumpled and fell to the ground. Beside him was the Colt forty-five, and a note saying, All I have belongs to Sonia Vinickers. Another letter written that evening to his solicitor clerk said, I have given the matter of my future much thought, and I realize that although I am innocent, I have not the chance of the proverbial snowball in Hades of getting out of this mess. Several hours later, as the grey flat light of the 16th of February dawned, Sonia Vinickers awoke at 51 Josefstrasse, Duren. She found Chesney's letter on the floor near her front door. It read, My dear Sonia, by the time you read this letter, I will no longer be here. You know I am unschuldig, but with what has happened in the past, it would be difficult to prove. I ask your forgiveness and hope you will start a new life. Ches. None of Chesney's family claimed possession of his remains. His father, long thought to have died in the Russian Revolution, had, in fact, witnessed his son's trial in 1926 from the shadows. But he never contacted him. He remarried and had a daughter, Patricia. They knew nothing of his errant son, long abandoned by an errant father, in 1914. What John Merritt's thoughts were when he sat in his home in Surrey, not far from where his son had murdered two women, cannot be known. Nor is it known what he thought when he read of his son's death just days later in a wooded area of a Cologne suburb. It was a secret he took with him to the grave when he died in 1966. Gerda Schaller requested and was granted permission to see Ronald Chesney's body in the mortuary. She paid the equivalent of £83 for a burial service for him. The Roman Catholic priest refused to conduct a service for him. Chesney's burial took place at 8am on the 23rd of February 1954, at which there was a solitary mourner, Gerda Schaller. He left her nothing. His money went to Sonia along with his last letter. Gerda Schaller, dressed in black and a long black coat, followed his coffin to the gravesite in a corner of the churchyard reserved for suicides. Her solitary figure was captured by a photographer and widely published in the press. It was a suitable epitaph for the life and death of Ronald Chesney, also known as John Donald Merritt. <laughs>